Hello everyone. We are going to space again tonight for a new cruise in the solar system. Our destination is the system formed by Jupiter and its numerous satellites. We will visit several of them, not just the four main moons of Jupiter, which are very different from one another, but also smaller satellites, and we will discover what the largest planet of the solar system is thought to be made of, how it interacts with other bodies, and what could be found inside and on the surface of its moons, where we will spend the most part of this journey. So, before takeoff, just take a short moment to adopt a comfortable position. You can sit or lie down, and you can still participate in this with your eyes closed. You only need to let me guide you and listen to explanations. There is probably tension in your shoulders. And now is a good moment to release it gently. After that, you can also check the rest of your body for more tension that you could let go of, like the muscles of your face and your toes, in your arms, your hands, your legs your feet and toes. If you fall asleep during the story, you can always use the timestamps on your screen and in the description and also in the first command to return where you left. There are also links in the first command to audio streaming sites like Spotify or Apple Music if you wish to listen to my stories there. And finally, a link to my Patreon page. It is always a pleasure for me to share with patrons and welcome new ones. If you decide to join this page, you will be able to download stories in different formats. There are about 90 ones available right now. You will be able to listen to them as podcasts, with or without background sounds, and you also get updates on what I'm working on. And importantly, you contribute to keep this channel free of ad breaks for everyone, before, during, or after videos. And now that you are all settled, let's begin our journey to space. As you know, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system, and it is visible to the naked eye on many nights. The first planets from the Sun in our system are rocky, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Beyond the orbit of Mars, begins the realm of gas and ice giants, planets that do not have a well-defined hard surface, but are giant balls of gas, denser and denser as you approach their core. And it is believed that underneath all these layers of increasingly hot gases, they have a solid core where metal dominates. These include Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. But rocky bodies can still be found beyond Mars, and there are many of them. Some float in a region called the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. 
including fairly large ones like Ceres or Vesta, that are not large enough to be classified as planets, but they follow their own orbit around the Sun. And beyond Neptune, there is also an even larger asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt, that includes Pluto or Eras. And in between these two asteroid belts, in the region of the gas and ice giants, there are many, many rocky and solid bodies of all sizes that have been captured and turned into satellites by these gas giants. Jupiter has dozens of satellites. Some are called moons because they are larger and due to their size they tend to adopt a ball spherical shape. Others are smaller asteroids, sometimes a few miles across or less, all the way down to small rocks and dust. Saturn has so many small objects in its orbit and they are so brilliant that they form visible rings. Jupiter also has rings they are less large and less dense, which is why they are more discreet. Along our cruise, we will land on several of the larger satellites, including the four main ones that are called the Galilean moons of Jupiter, because they were observed for the first time with a rudimentary telescope by Italian astronomer Galileo in the 17th century. But first, let's go to Jupiter. In our last cruise to Mars, I told you about the distance and how an itinerary could be decided based on orbits and the distance from Earth to Mars because the distances between planets are constantly changing depending on their own movement along their orbits. Sometimes they can be aligned on the same side of the Sun, in which case they are closer, or they can be on either side of the Sun, and in that case the distance is much more. The same applies to travel from Earth to Jupiter. When the two planets are at their closest point, the distance is 365 million miles, almost 600 million kilometers. At its farthest, it is almost twice as much. Now, to get a sense of distances inside the solar system, Let's bear in mind that Earth is actually much closer to the Sun than it is to Jupiter. The distance between Earth and the Sun is about 93 million miles. And to express astronomical distances in a simpler way, an unit, the astronomical unit, was defined. One astronomical unit is equivalent to the distance between our planet and the Sun. So, by definition, Earth is one astronomical unit away from the star. And Jupiter is five times farther, precisely 5.2 astronomical units, meaning that the planet and its moons receive less solar energy and also that light from the Sun reaches them later than Earth. The sunlight needs only 8 minutes to reach Earth, but it needs 43 minutes to reach Jupiter. Being farther from our star, Jupiter also has a much longer orbit than Earth and it is slower on its orbit. 
actually the farther planets are from the Sun, the slower they tend to be on their orbit. This is an effect of gravitation. The fastest planet in the solar system is also the closest to the Sun, Mercury. And it travels in space at almost 50 km per second. That's equivalent to more than 100,000 miles per hour. Earth travels at close to 30 km per second. Jupiter is significantly slower. Only 13 km per second. And so, between the longer distance to close one revolution around the Sun, plus the slower speed, Jupiter needs a lot more time to complete a full revolution and orbital journey around the Sun. It needs about 12 of our years. The one characteristic that makes Jupiter stand out in the solar system is obviously its large size. It is still a very small body compared with the Sun, less than a thousandth of the Sun mass, but it is much bigger than any other planet, and even bigger than all the other planets of the solar system combined. Its mass is two and a half times the mass of all the other planets together. We will pay more attention to Jupiter later, including its composition and formation history. But for now, we are approaching its periphery, and it is time to take a look at its bigger moons. As I told you, there are four of them. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. They are all very different from one another, and we are going to make a stop on each one. These four moons are called Galilean moons, as we said earlier, because they were first observed four centuries ago by Galileo Galilei. At the time, they were the first objects found to orbit a planet other than the Earth, and their discovery was a big deal, because it challenged views on the nature and the shape of the cosmos. I will also give you a link in the description to my story about cosmology and the evolution of descriptions of the universe over time. Jupiter was always well known since the dawn of human times because it is visible in the night sky. After the Sun and Venus, it is the third brightest object. But its satellites are way too small to be visible to the naked eye. So only the use of a rudimentary telescope made the observation possible. We will see their history, their orbits, and how these orbits are in resonance with each other. But for now, let's approach the first one, Io. Io is the closest to Jupiter of the four, the innermost and the third largest of Galilean moons. It is slightly larger than our moon, and it is a very dense body, the densest of any moon in the solar system. It also stands out for its volcanic activity, which is extreme. There are more than 400 active volcanoes at its surface, and some of them produce plumes of sulfur that climb as high as 300 miles, that's about 500 kilometers. This makes the surface of Io constantly ravaged by eruptions and clouds of gas released by the volcanoes. 
to us it may look almost like a representation of hell. So why is Io so geologically active? Because of the presence of Jupiter and other moons, but especially the mass of Jupiter, it causes a phenomenon called tidal heating. What is it? You know that rocky planets and moons in the solar system are very hot inside. Their crust at the surface solidified because it became cooler over time. And with this cooling process over millions and millions of years, the crust tends to become thicker. But there is still intense heat inside that remains trapped as a consequence of mainly two phenomena. First, there is the creation of these bodies when a lot of smaller asteroids and dust collided to form them. These collisions generated a lot of energy, a lot of heat, that dissipates very slowly because it is accumulated inside, under the crust. And then there is a second and more important phenomenon that happens inside planets, radioactive decay. Unstable large atoms like uranium and a few others fission. They suddenly reorganize their particles into smaller atoms. And in the process, they liberate energy and free particles that do not get stuck into the new atoms. This fission of unstable atoms tends to make them disappear over time, but it takes hundreds of million years for some of them, and there are less and less, but they still maintain a residual presence. Their decay, this radioactive decay, because it liberates radiation, is a natural phenomenon and it keeps hitting rocky planets from within or satellites. This radioactive decay also happens inside the moon, our moon, and there is most probably the same mechanism inside Io. But in the case of this body, a much bigger contributor to its internal heating is the mass of Jupiter nearby and the gravitation forces that result from it. As Jupiter is very massive, the side of Io that is closer to the planet has a slightly larger gravitational pull than the opposite side. And due to the presence of other moons around Jupiter that influence its orbit, The orbit of Io is not perfectly circular, it is elliptical. Depending on its position, the Moon can be closer or farther from Jupiter. This means that as the Moon is in motion, it is subject to different intensities of gravitational pull, and this force causes distortion of Io's shape as if you had an orange in your hand and you would squeeze it, press it in different parts. It is not going to destroy it, but it is going to flex its interior. This happens to Io, and at the scale of a rocky body like this one, it means constant friction inside the planet, which generates heat. And this is tidal heating, the gravitational pull of a large body that is strong enough to distort its satellite as the satellite follows an elliptical orbit and moves from being closer to being farther constantly. More than any moon in the solar system, this hits the inside of Io due to friction and this is what drives its intense volcanic activity. There is a lot of energy waiting to be released, and the constant flexing of the Moon 
makes its surface prone to moving and breaking. Apart from volcanoes, more than a hundred mountains have been identified that have been uplifted by compression of the crust. Io may be way smaller than Earth, it is about the size of the moon, but because of that, it has mountains higher than Mount Everest. And in between these spectacular mountains, there are rocky plains, and here again, volcanism influences the moon, because lava is constantly released. Io has a relatively young surface, that gets renewed with new material coming from the inside of the moon. On telescopes and cameras, Io appears in shades of yellow, white, black, red, even green, that correspond to different types of sulfur. All the surfaces on moons and planets tend to have visible craters the remains of asteroid impacts, but Io doesn't, because the surface flows of lava, that can sometimes be several hundred miles long, they constantly renew its surface and erase traces of impact. There is a very tenuous atmosphere on the moon. First, because it is not massive enough to retain a thick atmosphere. And second, because Jupiter is close, as we said, and tends to steal gases from Io due to its gravitational pull. It is estimated that the atmosphere loses a ton of matter per second due to this. This is not that much on such a scale and the faint atmosphere gets renewed by gases released by the volcanoes, mainly sulfur dioxide. As soon as they are released by the volcanoes, these gases tend to freeze due to the intense cold. The inside may be very hot, but Io is much further from the sun than we are. There is no atmosphere to retain heat, and when the moon passes in the shadow of Jupiter, it does not receive any solar energy at all. But when Io is exposed to the sun, a superficial layer of this sulfur dioxide sublimates, which means that it returns instantly to a gaseous state, and this is what maintains a bit of atmosphere. There would be much more to say about Io, but let's change setting and move to a second moon, one that also has exciting features, Europa. Europa presents a few cracks and streaks on its surface, but it has the smoothest surface of any known solid body in the solar system. There are very few uh, craters or mountains. It is the smallest of the four Galilean moons, and it is slightly smaller than the Earth moon. Why the smooth surface, and what is Europa made of? Its density suggests that overall its composition is similar to terrestrial planets of the solar system. Primarily, it is made of silicate rocks, that is to say, large quantities of silicon and oxygen, and it is likely that its core is rich in metal, especially iron. But the smooth surface and other observations strongly suggest that the outer layer of the moon is made of water, this layer would be about 60 miles thick, 100 kilometers. And so the surface of Europa would be essentially frozen water ice. And the question is, 
if temperatures are higher under this layer of ice, there could be an ocean of liquid water underneath. But first, what is the dynamic of this solid surface? Because it features a lot of darker streaks of lines that are visible from space. The most likely explanation is that there were, and there continues to be, eruptions of ice between plates. The ice under would be warmer and erupt, causing the crust to spread open and expose warmer layers beneath. In a sense, this is a phenomenon that reminds of oceanic ridges on Earth between plates even though in this case the environment and the material involved are completely different. So, this is compatible with the existence of a subsurface ocean. If the ice under the crust is warmer, there may be a point where the temperature is high enough for water to become liquid. What would heat this ocean? high temperature from the inner layers of the moon, and here again, like for Io, this phenomenon of tidal heating that we just discussed, it may contribute to warm up water. Surface temperatures are extremely cold. At the equator, we are talking about minus 160 degrees Celsius that's minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, because there is barely any atmosphere, and Europa receives less sunlight than Earth. At the poles, the temperature plunges to minus 220 degrees Celsius. And it also passes in the shadow of Jupiter regularly for several of our hours. Europa takes three and a half days to complete a revolution around Jupiter. So for several hours in a row, it is plunged in complete darkness and no longer receives direct sunlight. At this moment, the surface temperature at the poles must drop to levels that are not that far from the absolute zero. So in any case, the ice crust is uh, thick, at least several miles or several kilometers, but there is an ongoing debate about how thick it is, and this is important because if it is thin, relatively thin, there could be exchanges between the liquid ocean and the surface from time to time. When these streaks form, or maybe when an asteroid hits the moon and breaks the crust. Whereas if the ice crust is dozens of kilometers thick, the hypothetical liquid ocean and the surface would be totally separated. But in any case, the existence of liquid water is likely on Europa, and that could possibly be a lot of water if the water layer is about 100 kilometers thick, which is the dominant theory at the moment, and even if half of it is solid ice, that would make more liquid water than on Earth. This is absolutely huge. So if there exists a place with water and heat coming from the inner layers of the moon, then this raises the possibility of the existence of life on Europa. And this is why this moon has had a, a high profile among the moons of Jupiter in the past decades, since various discoveries were made. Discoveries about Europa itself, its composition, and discoveries on Earth, in the abyss. We know that life is possible in complete darkness, with food chains that start with bacteria able to resist very high pressure and temperature. 
bacteria that can feed on chemicals released by the Earth's crust, and then bigger and more complex organisms that feed on this bacteria. So maybe a similar phenomenon exists thousands of kilometers under the extremely cold ice crust of Europa, in the darkness and the high pressure of its subsurface ocean. This is just about theoretical conditions for life that could be present on the moon. There was never any proof that it exists, but there are long-term projects for missions that could go to Europa to search for evidence of life. Now, even though life exists somewhere on Europa, it doesn't mean its surface would be welcoming to human beings at all. Apart from the cold, radiation is very intense due to the lack of atmosphere and the lack of magnetic field like the one we have on Earth. And Jupiter, which is close, emits heavy radiation. So any manned mission would have to leave behind very heavy anti-radiation walls or buried deep down in ice under the surface to find protection against this radiation. Europa is the smallest of the four Galilean moons, as I said. Now let's go to the largest and the third one outward from Jupiter, which also has yet again a completely different environment, Ganymede. I told you that Europa needed three and a half days to orbit Jupiter. Ganymede needs seven days. And actually there is an interesting interaction between these three satellites, Io, Europa and Ganymede, and the planet Jupiter. The three satellites are in orbital resonance. Their orbital periods are synchronized. Europa needs exactly twice as much time as Io to orbit Jupiter, and Ganymede twice as much time as Europa, so that is exactly four times as much time as Io. They are in an orbital resonance of one, two, four. What is this concept of orbital resonance? And why does it happen like this? As you know, all planets in the solar system orbit around the Sun, which has by far the biggest mass of any object in the system. Actually, the Sun represents more than 99% of the matter in the entire system. But the Sun is not the only body that influences orbits even though they are smaller. Planets also have an influence over each other that depends on their masses and the distances between them. So it is true to say that the Sun determines orbits because it is by far the biggest factor. But if we go a bit further into detail, it is not 100% accurate. Other bodies everybody also has a small influence on every other one. A large planet can distort the orbit of a smaller body and eventually modify it so much, revolution after revolution, that this object may be placed on another orbit or even expelled from the solar system. This probably happened many times along the history of the solar system, and there is a phenomenon that can greatly increase the influence between two bodies in space. It is when they exert regular, periodic influence on each other. For a comparison, think about when you are pushing a child on a swing. The swing has its own frequency, but even without touching the ground, 
The child can amplify the movement by pushing with his body, because this pushing acts in a periodic repetition and it has a cumulative effect on the motion. On a bigger scale, this is what can happen between planets or the moons orbiting a planet. And this is this phenomenon which is called orbital resonance. Very often this mutual influence is unstable. The two bodies exchange momentum and it shifts their orbits progressively to the point that the resonance disappears. But under some circumstances, sometimes, a resonant system like this can become stable because it is self-correcting. The exchange of momentum between bodies keeps them in a stable resonance. It is the case, for example, between Neptune and Pluto. The two are in a resonance of 2, 3. It means that when Neptune does precisely three revolutions around the Sun, Pluto does exactly two. And the same kind of resonance formed between Io, Europa and Ganymede in a ratio of 1 to 4. When Ganymede does one revolution around Jupiter, Europa does two and Io does four. Another effect of momentum and gravitation that applies to Ganymede is that the Moon is also tidally locked to Jupiter. This means that it always presents the same face to the planet. Most Moons have this characteristic. They don't rotate on themselves. It's the same with our Moon. We always see the same face, looking at it from the Earth. But now let's take a look at Ganymede itself. What Ganymede stands out for the most is that it is the largest moon in the solar system. Its diameter is only 40% the diameter of Earth. But it is bigger than the planet Mercury. It is not as massive as Mercury though because Ganymede is made of lighter material, lighter elements. Mercury contains a lot of metal, whereas it is estimated that Ganymede has a core of metal and rock, but is also half made of water. In different states, different types of ice, I'll come back to this, and maybe between them there could be liquid water, so as for Europa, there is speculation about the possibility of life in the uh, oceans of Ganymede. But it looks less likely or harder to prove for several reasons. First, because the outer layer of ice is much thicker than on Europa. So reaching the liquid part looks very hard close to impossible at the moment, and also it is uncertain whether the bottom of this subsurface ocean reaches the rocky mantle underneath. It is believed that there is another layer of ice, but not the same type that we are familiar with. On Earth, we essentially know ordinary water ice, frozen water, which forms at certain conditions of pressure and temperature. Typically, when the temperature drops below zero degrees Celsius and at sea level pressure on Earth. But if the pressure is higher, you need a lower temperature for water to freeze. Now, you know that ice is a crystalline form. It means that water requires a highly ordered microscopic structure. Billions and billions of molecules become perfectly ordered, following a pattern. 
it almost never happens on Earth because of the conditions of temperature and pressure we have on our planet. But there are different possible crystalline forms, different patterns that water may adopt. And these different crystalline structures could be explored and studied in laboratories, showing that different types of ice may exist. Ordinary water ice is called ice one, and many other possibilities of structure have been identified, ice two, three, four, five, and so on. It is believed that the inner layer of ice on Ganymede is ice three, which forms when liquid water is exposed to a temperature of minus 20 to minus 30 degrees Celsius, plus a pressure of 200 to 300 times the sea level pressure we have on Earth. On our planet, these conditions can only exist in a laboratory because naturally, where there is enough pressure at the bottom of oceans, the temperature is higher than that. And where the temperature is low enough, because minus 20 to minus 30 degrees Celsius is perfectly reachable in the winter in many parts of the world, but in that case there is not enough pressure because it is at the surface. So these conditions are not naturally met in our environment, but it seems they are in the depth of Ganymede's oceans. So at its surface, Ganymede is mainly made of water ice, but there are other elements that probably arrived as a result of impacts with smaller bodies. One third of the surface is dark and covered in clays and organic compounds that are believed to be traces of impactors that collided with the moon. Contrary to Europa and Io, the surface is quite ancient in average because there is not much activity that renews it, but there are still grooves and ridges that are not completely explained at this point given the structure of the moon, but that could have appeared, maybe, hundreds of millions of years ago, when its surface was more active than it is now. Ganymede may have less chance of harboring life than Europa, but when it comes to human presence and exploration, it may be a bit more welcoming. There is less radiation because of the longer distance to Jupiter and also thanks to a degree of protection from a magnetic field that seems to be generated like on Earth by the dynamo effect of a, a rotating metallic core at the center of the Moon. The level of radiation is still deadly and the temperature and pressure very hostile but with adapted protections, it is not impossible to think of a human base one day on Ganymede. Out of the different moons of Jupiter, Ganymede presents a less difficult set of conditions than Io and Europa. But there is even better, Callisto. We still have a fourth Galilean moon to look at. Callisto is the fourth of them by distance to Jupiter, and thanks to this, it has the lowest radiation levels, but there are other interesting features that distinguish it. I told you that the surfaces of Io and Europa were fairly young in astronomical times, that is to say, still millions of years. But in contrast, Callisto has the oldest solid surface in the entire solar system. It seems that since its formation, there was never any kind of subsurfaces processes like volcanism or plate tectonics 
that could have rejuvenated the surface. So it never changes at all, except for impacts. Callisto has the most cratered surface in the solar system. It is completely covered in impact craters that have appeared over probably several billion years. So why is Callisto so inactive geologically? It is believed that this is due to its formation history. Callisto would have formed very slowly from the accretion of smaller rocks, but not fast enough to reach a high temperature inside. And as a result, the moon is not fully differentiated internally. What it means is that bodies of a certain size, planets or large moons, tend to have a structure in layers internally. The heavier elements converge to the center, to the core, and various elements above it form layers that are clearly distinct in terms of chemical composition and conditions of temperature and pressure. It is the case of rocky planets like ours, and the three first moons we just visited. This process of differentiation is never at a hundred percent. For example, there can be movements in the mantle of a planet that can make small quantities of metals go up and reach the surface. But still, large bodies acquire an organized structure overall, one that is differentiated but this process was very incomplete on Callisto, and it makes it the largest body in the solar system that is not fully differentiated. Elements inside are mixed up, and there are several layers made of rock and ice mixed together. Here again, the various conditions mean that the structure of ice differs depending on how deep it is inside the moon. The crust is made of ice one, the ordinary one on Earth, but inside it is believed there is also ice five, six and seven with different crystalline structures. And under tens of miles of icy crust, Probably, yet again, another ocean of liquid water that has been isolated from space for billions of years since nothing ever happens on the surface of Callisto except occasional impacts that do not reach beyond the icy crust. After the Earth, Moon and Mars, Callisto is a possible target for manned missions one day clearly not in the 2020s or 30s. It is way farther than Mars, and there is no specific project now. But if one day men set foot on one of the moons of Jupiter, it is likely to be Callisto first. The low radiation level and the geologic stability are advantages, and Callisto could be a good base as a station for further exploration of the solar system and remote exploration of Europa in the search for traces of life, for example. Until now, we have spoken about the four main moons of Jupiter. But there are many more of smaller sizes that were discovered long after you remember that Galileo observed these four moons in 1610. It took almost three centuries then, to the end of the 19th century, to start discovering more and smaller moons of Jupiter. Today at this point, 79 moons in total have been found and named. They are called moons when they are large enough and there are also moonlets and dozens of smaller satellites. Together with the planet, they form a system called the Jovian system 
we'll take a look at some of these smaller bodies and also at the rings of Jupiter. But before, let's talk about the planet itself. As you know, Jupiter is by far the largest and the most massive planet of the system. It has two and a half times the mass of all other planets combined. It is also probably the oldest planet of the system, the first to form, according to current models of planetary formation. These are all theories based on our knowledge of the history of the solar system and physics, not absolute certainties. But the dominant models, right now, suggest that Jupiter formed quite far from the Sun, beyond the limit called the Snow Line. This is the distance to an early star where it is sufficiently cold for volatile compounds like water to condense into solids. The origins of Jupiter would have started with a large solid core one of rock and metal that would still exist today at the center of the planet and around which huge quantities of gas like hydrogen and helium would have aggregated, kept together by gravitation. After a few million years, which is short at this scale, the various other planets of the solar system were not formed yet, and the system was essentially a gigantic disk of gas and dust, with a newborn star in its center. So rather quickly, Jupiter gained enough mass to absorb or satellite everything on its orbit to clean it up, and reach a mass that was already 50 times the Earth's mass. Nowadays, after absorbing more gases and rocky bodies, Jupiter is more than 300 times as massive as Earth. But because it is less dense, being primarily made of gas, it has 1300 times the volume of Earth. Now the fact that it is a gas planet doesn't mean that it is like a cloud that could be crossed easily. The more you move towards the center, towards the core, the denser and hotter the planet becomes. Due to the mass, temperatures and pressure inside Jupiter reach levels that are way higher than at the center of Earth. And the gravitational forces that keep the planet together are very powerful. Jupiter has a composition dominated by hydrogen it is about three quarters of its mass and 90% of its volume. And it is so much matter that the interior is strongly compressed. This compression generates heat. And actually Jupiter generates, emits more heat by itself than it receives from the Sun. But however massive Jupiter is, it is not enough to ignite the same reactions of fusion between atoms of hydrogen that happen inside the Sun, which is why it didn't turn into a star. We know that there are systems where more than one star forms, even though this is not the most frequent case. If Jupiter had gained more mass, it could have turned into a second star after the Sun. But the planet stayed well short of that. It is estimated that it would need to be 75 times more massive to ignite fusion. So because it is a gas planet, there is no solid surface to land on. The planet begins as a cloud of low density and becomes increasingly dense. If we were to enter this big ball after gaseous hydrogen, we would reach a layer of liquid hydrogen turned into liquid by the rising pressure. 
followed by another layer of so-called metallic hydrogen. Another phase of hydrogen. It doesn't mean it turns to metal in the usual sense of the term, but that under such conditions, hydrogen behaves like an electrical conductor, which is why it is called metallic hydrogen. Jupiter and also Saturn would contain a lot of this metallic hydrogen form due to their large masses that compress hydrogen. Now visually, when we look at Jupiter, we also see several bands or belts of color, different colors, that are segregated all around the planet. And there is also a giant spot. These bands move at different speeds. They are made of clouds, clouds of ammonia that float in the upper layers of the atmosphere and their movements cause strong turbulences. In its upper layers, Jupiter has powerful winds. The various bands have different circulation patterns. They move at different speeds, and their interactions create turbulence and even storms. This is what the Great Red Spot is believed to be. It is a vortex, a storm, that probably did not always exist, but became a stable feature of Jupiter's atmosphere. Jupiter being very big for a planet, the red spot is bigger than Earth, and it rotates counterclockwise, in the opposite direction to the bands of clouds. The phase of fast growth is long over. For Jupiter, there is no longer much matter to aggregate, like in the early stages of the solar system. But the planet keeps attracting bodies, like comets, that are captured by its gravitational pull and fall on it. Jupiter would receive about 200 times more asteroids and comet impacts than Earth. For a long time, it was believed that Jupiter played an important role here in shielding rocky planets, including ours, from asteroid impacts, because it would have acted as a gravity well located at the limit of the inner solar system, being the first and biggest of giant planets. So Jupiter would have been like a vacuum cleaner of the system. But this view is now more disputed because also due to its mass, Jupiter could attract more asteroids and comets to uh, draw them from the Kuiper belt, the larger belt of asteroids that exists beyond Neptune. So this debate is still open, and it is unsure at this point whether Jupiter is such a shield for Earth. But in any case, due to its mass and age, Jupiter has the largest number of large satellites of any planet in our system, and it also has rings. These rings are not obvious like the rings of Saturn, and actually they were discovered only recently, in 1979, when a space probe, Voyager 1, explored the Jovian system. These rings are not as large, comparatively, as Saturn's, and they are way less bright, which is why they were not seen before. Saturn's rings contain a lot of ice that reflects light, whereas Jupiter's rings are primarily made of dust. And in between, or around these rings, there are more moons, dozens of moons. I told you earlier that Jupiter had 79 in total, so let's explore a few of them. Other Jovian moons than the four largest ones started to be discovered in 1892, and they are much smaller, so they were harder to identify from Earth. Initially, they were given numbers, Jupiter 5, 6, 7, and so on. Jupiter 5 
is also called Amalthea, and it is the fifth biggest moon, and the last one discovered by direct visual observation. The following ones were found by photographic or digital imaging, that is to say they were seen on photographs of space using extended exposure time, which allows to capture objects that could not have been noticed otherwise. Like other smaller moons, Amalthea interacts with Jupiter's rings. These rings contain dust ejected from the surface of these moons. Amalthea is also not large enough to acquire a spherical shape so it looks irregular. Its maximal length is about 160 miles or 250 kilometers. Put near Earth, it would look about the size of Massachusetts or Belgium. It is believed that this moon formed far from Jupiter because its structure is light and it contains water ice. In the early stages of Jupiter's formation, the planet emitted a lot of heat, and based on the distance to Jupiter, it is very close, this moon would have entirely melted. So the theory is that Amalthea formed farther in the solar system and was captured as a satellite afterwards. Visually, the moon looks very red, which may be due to sulfur it would have collected from Io, which is also close, but this is uncertain. Amalthea orbits at only 180,000 kilometers from Jupiter, which is only a bit more than the diameter of the planet. It looks really close. So if we were to land on this moon and look at Jupiter, the planet would look huge. Imagine something eight times bigger than the moon when we watch it in the night sky. But there is even closer than Amalthea. Jupiter 16, also known as Metis, is the innermost known moon of Jupiter. It orbits at only 130,000 kilometers, which is less than Jupiter's diameter and it is the fastest moving moon of all. It orbits at 30 kilometers, or almost 20 miles per second. This moon is far too small to be spherical. Its maximal length is 60 kilometers by a width of 40, so it looks like a big asteroid. And Metis is just in the middle of one of the rings. And this is not a coincidence, it is dust from this moon that generates the ring when there are impacts with rocks. Material can easily be ejected from Metis because of the low gravity. And there are two more moons like Amalthea and Metis, Adrastia and Thebe, that also have irregular shapes. And then there are 70 more smaller moons that orbit much farther from Jupiter. It is believed that these bodies had their own orbit around the Sun, like asteroids from the asteroid belt, and they were progressively captured by Jupiter. They float in space, away from the rings, and are only a few miles across sometimes. Some of them follow a prograde orbit, that is to say, they orbit in the same direction as Jupiter's rotation, and others are retrograde, which is the opposite. These ones travel the opposite way of Jupiter's rotation. It is well possible that more will be discovered. At this point, more than 20 of these small, irregular satellites have not been named. They were just given a number. And discoveries continue. As recently as 2020, more candidates were found on orbits that are far from the planet. <laughs>
and the population of moonlets could be uh, in the hundreds. It depends where the limit size is fixed. So we have reached the end of this little exploration of the Jovian system. And it is now time to return to Earth. I hope you enjoyed it and you can now fall asleep or pick another story. I put a few links in the description if you want more space related stories, including the recent journey to Mars. Sleep well, sweet dreams, au revoir.